Christian Yelich is arguably the best hitter in all of baseball. Well, Jake and I break down his swing in the first edition of our Mechanical Breakdown series on episode number five of the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast. And be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. We're on Apple, Google, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and the TuneIn Radio app. And subscribe to our YouTube page as well, the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast, for full episodes and clips from previous episodes. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition, episode number five of the Lab Epstein Hitting Podcast. My name is Jim, and joining me, as always, is renowned hitting instructor, coach, my former coach, current co-host and friend, Jake Epstein. Jake, how you doing, my friend? How are you? I'm doing well. Back in back in Texas, and got the lab set up down here, and we've, we've started some small group training just to keep the numbers down it's you know it's kind of a new scenario with the social distancing but uh pretty excited to get back to work i know all the all the players are too well today we are doing our first installation of our mechanical breakdown series and we'll be breaking down one of your favorite players and arguably the best hitter in baseball christian yelich we're really looking forward to that Uh, he seems to be kind of a lightning rod for uh, hitting instructors out there, whether they know what they're t- talking about or not, when it comes to his hitting mechanics. So I think he's a great guy to break down on our first installation of our mechanical breakdown series. First thing, though, I want to ask you, so I came up with uh, something this week. Um, I found how, uh, the ba- how hitting the baseball at a certain spot creates the backspin, and then um, hitting it at a certain spot is more ideal. Uh, which is under, kind of underneath the middle part of the ball, and then when you hit on the more uh, top part of the baseball, you get that knuckling effect. What I used to use as a cue, though, was cut the baseball in half. What would be a good cue? And this is just off the top of my head thinking about it this week. What would be a good cue for coaches out there um, to get kids to get on playing with the pitch and get that proper backspin and hit it um, at the ideal angle to where they can achieve what that kind of backspin that they want you know and, and backspin now with the Rapsodo technology and and you know getting spin rates you know it really tells us golf has been doing it with TrackMan for a while um, giving us spin rates so you know too much backspin is uh, a pop-up you yeah. know you get that thing over 2000 or 2500 rpms um and not enough backspin the ball doesn't stay in the air as long so you know, and hitting's hard. So, you know, what is that perfect scenario? I love your cue about slicing through it, you know, hitting, slicing through the middle of the ball. Sometimes I use the analogy of somebody throwing a grapefruit at you and you have a giant samurai sword and you're trying to slice that in half. And what that does is that keeps the hands flat. So it, it, it's you can swing up and create backspin. You can swing down and create backspin. Um what is that magic number, you know, in between? Yeah. Typically, if if the, the so Yelich is is perfect because he he doesn't really have a barrel dump, right? He keeps his barrel up, mm-hmm. kind of above that pitch plane until his barrel, and we'll see this on video until he gets to you know the middle of his body, and then he stays there. But a lot of players get to the back of the baseball, mm-hmm. and when things go wrong is from about two inches behind the baseball right before contact to two inches after contact that is that's where money is made or lost and so many players will do something with their hands or they'll swing they'll extend up too much or they'll roll their top hand over or vice versa they'll extend down too much 
and create pop-ups. So it's more than just, you know, a lot of people say, and even Yelich says, oh, if I hit it out in front, mm -hmm. I will get more lift. Okay, well, that works for him because of what he does with his approach position, what he does early in the swing. If you were to tell that to a Brandon Belt, he would say, you're crazy, man. Every time I hit it out in front, I hit a ground ball to the pull side. So it all depends on what your swing is doing prior to contact, where your contact point should be. So Yelich kind of is very flat in the beginning of his swing. Therefore, he has to hit the ball out in front. Yeah. Uh, players that dump that barrel early, they have to let the ball get much deeper. I had this problem when I was playing too, though. Sometimes I knuckled it way too much, and knuckling's great, but it really doesn't go anywhere or, or get that I ideal trajectory. What's a cue to get rid of that knuckling and getting back to the backspin? Yeah, well, the problem with the knuckling is, you know, Jim, you, you hit the ball too perfect. That's the problem. You know, a knuckleball is a perfectly struck baseball. So your great coaching that you received at a younger age and athletic ability, you know, you were too perfect all the time. But, no, I mean, a knuckleball, it really is. It means that if the ball's coming down at 10 degrees and you swing up at 10 degrees and you hit the middle of the ball mm -hmm. and your barrel is perpendicular to the pitch – you're going to hit a knuckleball. Where do knuckleballs always go? They always go to the middle of the field, right? And they're always like, you know, 10 to 20 degrees off the ground. Yeah. And uh, th that happens. So, you know, what you can do is extend lower. So if you were a guy that, that hits, you know, a lot of knuckleballs to center or they hit a lot of, you know, they get some top spin to right field, right? They'll hit, if you're a left-handed hitter, you hit a line drive over the second baseman's head, but it, it doesn't backspin in the gap, right? It just kind of, and we're talking about hard, like, if you're 10 years old, you're not you're not going to hit a ball with backspin that stays in the air because you're not, you're not hitting it hard enough. Right. Okay, so you really don't maximize spin until you probably have an exit velocity of maybe 85 miles an hour or so, 80 85 miles an hour. That's when it starts to kick in. So, um, so typically somebody like like you that was just uh, you know it doesn't make sense. You know you you have a player like you, you hit a lot of line drives up the middle. Um, maybe you hit the ball a little bit higher to the opposite field because you're a left-handed hitter, left-center gap, but maybe you, when you pull the ball, you seem to create more topspin. So you hit a lot of line drives to right field, but they don't necessarily carry over the outfielder's head. Okay, sure. um, That player might think, I need more lift in my swing. I need to swing up more to hit the, to hit the ball higher. Well, what's probably happening is your barrel's getting right behind the ball, and you might be just swinging up too much and hitting the top half of the ball instead of the bottom half of the ball. So... Okay. Uh, you know, having a guy think about hitting the bottom half of the ball or maybe changing your extension point would be beneficial to change those kind of things. So that's where the technology is kind of fun to play around with. Yeah. Um, again, the ball doesn't lie. You can do it in BP too. But, you know, if you have a ref soda or you have a hit tracks and you have a player make a swing change, hey, I want you to extend here versus here or do this instead of that, then all of a sudden you can see the, the progress or the lack of progress. Maybe that didn't work, and we need to try something else. Hey, another thing I found on, on Twitter. I don't know, for a guy who says he hates Twitter, boy, I sure spend a lot of time on it. I found this on Twitter earlier in the week, though, again. Uh, somebody posed this question. I thought it would be pretty interesting. What do you think is harder to find? A hit, And this is from a scouting, scouting perspective. A hitter with plus bat speed or a hitter with innate timing? Uh, probably innate timing okay. for sure. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, there's so many variables that go into that because you can have really good bat speed, especially on a T, you know, or a front toss or a BP. Um, and you can, and you can manipulate that sure. in those environments with their perfect game scores. But timing is, uh, T timing is tough because it brings in it brings in your brain it brings in your vision not necessarily how clear you see it so I've had a lot of players that have 2015 vision but don't have great timing okay maybe because their death perception isn't great so sometimes we're I mean we're getting into something else here but sometimes players death perception isn't doesn't match how well their clarity is okay so um, death perception is how do the eyes work together in space okay. so so vision, uh, the brain, when we start moving, our rhythm, all of that plays into the timing factor. 
and timing is 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 gold you know quite honestly because if you have really really great swing but the ball's never in that timing window you don't have success and i've had players like that i remember one kid from the Pacific Northwest I worked with. It was the, the best darn BP hitter I've ever seen in my life. I mean, he'd hit, remember those one-inch balls we'd hit with a one-inch bat? He'd hit like every one of them on a line. Mm -hmm. And I'd check up on him. You know, he, he went to a div div Division One college. And I said, why aren't you playing, man? I mean, you've got the best eye-hand coordination I think I've ever seen. And he's like, well, I just get, I get so anxious, you know, and I'm early on stuff and pulling off. And, yeah. And it really, that relaxation and timing is, is critical. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but are you kind of saying that at times bat speed can be a little deceptive when you're looking at it from a scouting perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, good stuff, good stuff. All right, well, coming if, up. If there's a, I mean, for an example, if, if there's a 18-year-old player that's uh, going to gonna be drafted in the top 10 rounds, you know, an 18-year-old player that, that is somewhat physical, for 18, he's 190 pounds plus. Yeah. Um, if he's still playing mm -hmm. and, and he's still pretty successful at 18, he has bat speed. Like, sure. bat, bat speed isn't the issue. In fact, I was working with a kid last night here in Texas who's 160 pounds mm -hmm. and he hits the ball 95 plus miles an hour, his exit velocity. Mm -hmm. 160 pounds. Yeah. Like, <laughs> skinny, wiry, yeah. left hand hitting shortstop. Sure. And there's like I don't ever have to when, when you're 180 pounds your, your bat speed is going to be like made, your exit velocity is going to be in the big league ratio sure. but what is important for him to be successful because he hasn't been as successful as he wants it's that consistency mm -hmm. and it's that barrel being on the right plane at the right time yeah and by the way you can go back in the archives and check out our bat speed against bat quickness episode we did that last week it was a really good one that's available um, in the archives, don't forget to subscribe and like the podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify. We are on SoundCloud with clips as well. We're on TuneIn Radio and the TuneIn Radio app and our YouTube page, which continues to build, YouTube.com, Epstein Hitting Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to that for full episodes and clips from previous episodes as well. Jake and I are on Twitter and Instagram as well. I'm at Jim Tara. Jake is at Epstein Hitting. Coming up next, we're going to talk about Christian Yelich, break down his mechanics in our mechanical breakdown series. But first, Jake, good news for you, the lab, BCS, it's opening back up and you're having what you call spring break for, what is it, five to ten students um, and kind of getting guys back acclimated and back into the swing of things, no pun intended. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're calling it spring training to even though it's uh, early summer, uh, you know, to get guys ready if they're going out to summer ball or if they're going to going back to their colleges, you know, to kind of get in shape. So it's it's going to be fun. You know, we got a couple couple pro guys that 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 are involved in it, and, and guys that have been in spring training, like like myself and, and Matt, my you know my lead guy here in, in Texas. You know, he's spent ten years in spring training, so. We're gonna set it up. We got a guy that's running the pitchers, and, and you know it'll be kind of an all day. We'll do we'll do throwing, we'll do stretching, we'll do infield defense, outfield defense. We'll be able to couple that with a ton of hitting inside the lab, and then you know pitchers fielding work. We'll be able to run pickoffs. You know it's your typical spring training day, you know, and then at the end of the day we'll be able to do live at bats um, on the field. So this is a college and professional player kind of only deal that we're doing. To, to get them ready, ready, and then we'll have younger younger sessions later on in the summer. So pretty excited about it. Yeah, and with the times that we are in, you never know when baseball could be back. It could be back, who knows, next week. It could be back in a month, two months, wherever the case may be. So you want to get yourself in shape so you're don't so you ready to go, but you also don't get hurt. That's a big thing as well. So be sure to log on to the BC, uh, the labbcs.com and schedule your appointment and schedule your time and instruction today. All right, let's get into our topic this week, episode number five, and it is the first installation of our Mechanical Breakdown series, and we're doing Christian Yelich. Uh, just for the record, is he probably your favorite hitter right now throughout baseball? Yeah, I think so. I think he's my favorite hitter for you know a couple of reasons. One, he has a, he has a swing that, that holds up mm -hmm. against anything, you know, against velocity. Everybody has their holes, but 
you know, he, he can, if somebody's going to throw him, you know, 98 to 100 at his belt, he has the ability to get to that pitch. If they're going to bury, you know, sliders down low, he has the ability to get to that pitch. Um, and with that ability, you also have to have the mental makeup to, to make those adjustments. If you're looking for a fastball at the belt, you're not going to be able to hit a slider at your knees on that same pitch. So he has the right plan when he goes to the plate. You know, he limits his, his two-strike, you know, scenarios because his swing plane is good and he puts balls in play hard. Um, and I really, you know, he, he, he maximizes his body. He's a, he's a big, tall, lanky guy. Yeah. But by no means, he's not a – I should have looked this up, but I don't think he's a top-10 exit velocity guy um, in baseball. You know, I think if you look at his hard hit average, his hard hit average is super high because he finds barrels. But I don't think he's, you know, a top top 10 exit velocity guy um, when he does hit the ball hard. So what does that tell me? It tells me he's maximizing his body. You know, he's not a freak of nature. Um, he stays on plane for a long time and he creates the right um, the right spin, the right launch angle and spin. He can't muscle balls out of the park. What would you say about, um, and we're going to get into this uh, with the video, but just kind of uh, to whet the appetite of the audience, what would you say his attack angle um, would be? Because that's sort of... Uh, yeah, I, he's I, probably, it, yeah. You know, he's probably in that, when he hits the ball deeper in the zone, mm-hmm. um, he's probably closer to 5 degrees, and he probably goes from 5 to 15. Okay. You know, I guess 5 opposite field, 10... 10 more center field, center right, center, and then fifteen to the pull side. Mm-hmm. Well, looking at uh, I, I, to your point about exit velocity, we're on. I'm on Baseball Savant right now, baseballsavant.com, mm-hmm. and we're going to get into that a full episode on Baseball Savant later on um, in our data series. But I'm looking at the exit velocity leaders from last year. He's not in the top five. The top five guys: Nelson Cruz, Gary Sanchez, Mike Trout, Miguel Sano. And Aaron Judge really knows. I don't think there's any surprise with those five. Yelich yeah. Yelich oh, comes in. Yelich comes in at number nine. Okay. So yeah, and his exit velocity last year, uh, on average, was ninety three point one. His max was one hundred seventeen point nine. Okay. Yeah, that's that's fine at barrels. With Christian Yelich, by the way, to just to give you some background, if you don't know much about him probably do but if you don't he was the MVP in 2018 and last year he set career highs in batting average home runs on base percentage slugging percentage ops one of jake's favorite numbers and stolen bases so he can run a little bit he's very athletic 30 stolen bases last year and here's a stat with all the strikeouts throughout baseball now that pops out to me and this is according to the uh, milwaukee brewers media guy this year in 2020 he tied his career high in walks as well so he has not just very solid mechanics but a very solid approach as well he does and what people don't realize is he he missed the last month of the year last year um when he got hurt and i mean he was he was destroying it he was like a triple crown threat last year um, heading into that into that last month, so that was a real bummer for him, but obviously still put up some great numbers. Yeah, with that uh, hurt kneecap last year mm-hmm. you know, that caused him to miss the end of last season. Okay, let's get into the video here, and uh, this is a video again. You can listen along. Um, Jake will be kind of breaking it down. I'll be peppering him some questions, and this is a video that will also be going on the Epstein hitting um, the Epstein hitting Facebook page as well. Um, later on this weekend, uh, so you can follow along um, that way as well. And it's a video clip of, of Christian Yelich. He is hitting here at Citizens Bank Park, or a bandbox of ballpark, by the way, against the Phillies. And the Philly, by the way, I just <laughs> off <laughs> off topic. The Phillies have on their powder baby blue uniforms. I kind of like those. I, I those are kind of. Uh, Ike Schmidt is playing every position. Yeah. In this- <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're kind of the throwback 1980 uh, tape. Uh, they used to be, I think, the road uniforms, or maybe they were always yeah. an alternate. But I, I don't know. I, I, some, I feel like that's that's something your dad would enjoy a lot. That those that that uniform, the powder blue. The powder blue is great. We played Old Miss last year, and they wore the heck out of those powder blues. They look like pajamas out there. They look pretty darn comfortable. Yeah. Anyway, we'll get we'll get started here with with Yelich, and I'll I'll just kind of break into it uh, from the side here. So, number one, to be a good hitter, you have to wear your socks high, and you have to have the bumblebee stripes okay. on them. That's 
That's at least 20 points in the batting average. So um, that explains anyway. why I wasn't a good hitter. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so anyway, as we break this down, you know, one of the things you'll see here is is him loading into his rear hip. So, um, you know, we talked about timing and we talked about, um, you know, st- being able to control your stride, striding early enough, you know, being able not to jump at the ball, even though we're creating a weight shift, you know, holding weight and striding as slow as possible is really beneficial. And we can see here, he's not lifting his foot up really high. He doesn't have a giant leg kick where his knee comes up to his waist like a, like a Justin Turner or a Josh Donaldson. It's more of a glide where he's really going out. Now with that glide, the cool part is, you know, he could drop his foot say right there he could drop it early if it was a fastball in you know he's definitely in a fine position there if it's a change up he could keep his air in the keep his foot in the air longer and glide that out a little bit further okay so this was i believe a fastball so he was just timing this fastball up and you can see how long he gets with his base okay yeah. i mean that is a he's got very long legs mm-hmm. so yeah that, that, that's okay for him to have that base if you draw this line in here you know, I'm going to draw a triangle between his his base, between his feet, and along his inseams. And you can see it's more of a pyramid. The base is way wider than the sides. Not everybody is like that, but what you can't be is narrower than your inseam. Okay, so if you swing a, if you, you know, if you're six foot and you got a 32 inch inseam, 34 inches should probably fit between your arches in this position. So we have to make sure our base is wide enough. Now the the crucial part of this position when he's landing when his front foot lands and he keeps his knee closed a little bit longer but you can see his front hip is opening just a hair okay so he's creating some stretch but not only that this is the crucial part we've been working this at the lab all week this position where your chest is facing rearward your hands are back yet your hips are starting to open Okay, so this is his torque position. Where does all the torque go? Well, here it is. Okay, we we talked about that a couple weeks ago on the podcast. It's not necessarily how much you open your hips in this position. It's the fact that you keep your upper body back so that you can not only make adjustments, but also create resistance in your midsection for that torque. Okay, so really important stuff here. This launch position is fantastic. We do a lot of work from this position and getting to this position with our players. Um, if we go a little bit further here now we're going to finish his weight transfer and he's going to go into rotation so the one thing I want you to look at this was a home run by the way Jim I think he hit it to right center right yes pretty sure this is a home run to right center Um, and the pitch was not in okay so the pitch was probably one ball to the outside part of the plate maybe even two balls to the outside part of the plate from the middle okay so it wasn't like an inside fastball Uh, But you can still see how short he stays to the ball. So this is a really good position here when the upper body, I'm not going to give away too many of my secrets here, but where the upper body starts to open, notice where his hands are, okay? We talked about bat drag and and, uh, barrel dump and all that stuff. This is usually where it happens. You can see that his knob and his, his, his forearm are pretty close to each other here, and that bat is right next to his shoulder. And you can attest to this how many swings I made you take with the bat next to your shoulder or on your shoulder when you were trading it's just a great way to simplify the move and and get into the right position Um, and then you can see this he's released his back foot in okay so there's not a bug squishing and there's there's not a collapse of the backside by any stretch of the imagination okay his back foot's going to move forward partly because he's so wide it has to move forward a little bit because he's got to bring this thigh through now it gets a little bit blurry here, okay? But we're gonna I'm gonna try to draw a line here on the ball. So here's the ball blur to the catcher. Okay. And you can see he doesn't get on plane. His bat in this position is here. Okay. He hasn't dropped, and then I go one frame further. His bat is here. So he's still not on that pitch plane yet. He doesn't get on that pitch plane until about right here which is right before his front knee. And then he's going to stay on that out in front. Okay, And this one he lifts off maybe a little bit, but you can see how low his extension point is. Okay, So going back, this, we talked about extension. We talked about power V you know, in previous episodes. You can see where his is. If you just looked at this position with his arms and his, his extension point, 
the a lot of position. people would say he swung down. Mm-hmm. You know, they would think that, wow, he must have gone from A to C. Well, yeah. he didn't. That's just his way of doing things. Some people's power V is a lot higher than that, which could lead to topspin. Okay. But that is his key is he's so good at hitting the ball, you know, out in front. And, and again, out in front for him is different. Like this is out in front for him. Yeah. Because look how wide his base is. Most people are going to drop their foot right here. And if they drop their foot here, this is out in front of their front foot. Because he's so long with his stride, everything looks deeper in the zone based on his legs, but based on his upper body, it's not. You can see how much room is between his hands and his body here. So that's out in front for him. So everybody's a little bit different there. But it's that move that that creates his backspin hitting through the ball, his top hand extending through without rolling over. Okay, that is a very difficult move to teach. It's a move we try to teach everybody, but it's not a move that everyone can can do consistently. Mm-hmm. Um, that move works only if you're short here in the approach and you don't have any crazy, you know, barrel barrel dump or bat drag, the elbow coming in um, early in the swing. If you do, if you drop that barrel early back here, like you know, more more power hitters, you know, guys that hit 250 and hit 40 home runs, what happens is they get trapped underneath this pitch. I lost the pitch. Here's the pitch again. Okay, they get trapped. So say they drop their barrel down in here. Now all of a sudden they got to swing up more to come back up to it. So if they hit it right here, they'll hit it really good and really far. If they hit it here, they miss it or foul it back. If they hit it here, they top spin it to the right side. So that's the difference between somebody that's going to hit for a high average, somebody that's on plane for this long, versus somebody that's on plane for just one of those boxes. When you say here and and if he hits it here, you're talking about microseconds. I mean, that's what goes back to that question I posed earlier in the episode about the innate timing and how important it really is. It, it is. And the more you can expand those those milliseconds, the better. You know, the, if, you can, if you can make your timing window three inches bigger, uh, that's probably 10 points on a batting average, 20 yeah. points on a batting average. It's really, really crucial, especially as you get higher up and guys can change speeds more effectively. And, and it's just, it, it's, I mean, it's inches. That's, that's what's so, so crazy about it is that it's inches. Now, uh, for a little bit more context, uh, this is Zach Eflin who is on the mound pitching for the Phillies, and uh, Eflin is a sinker baller. He actually has four pitches, four seam fastball, slider, sinker, changeup. I'm not sure, at th- with this video, you'd know better than me, I think he's throwing a 93, well, the pitch is right down the middle, 93 miles per hour. I think he, th- with the shape of that, I think he's throwing a sinker right there. Am I wrong, or is that a four-seamer? Yeah, I mean, I'm putting, and, he, and even a sinker isn't that much, so I'm getting roughly seven degrees of drop on that pitch possibly even less yeah okay even be less than that but it is it is sinking i'm just tracing the line of the pitch to the catcher where the catcher's glove is going to catch it and we're looking at like about six degree drop so you can imagine what happens if you swing up at 20 degrees you swing up at 20 degrees that's a delta 20 minus six is 14 yeah that's a big delta okay so if if this is a 97 mile an hour fastball from a four seam high spin rate guy, that ball's probably only dropping three or four degrees. Yeah, uh, and that's going to be really tough. So if you're you're at, you're at 15 to 20 with your swing plane, and that ball is only dropping you know three or four degrees, that's that's going to make it a little bit tough. Well, and that's why you see a lot of guys with um, and and that's what that swing is built for. We talked about that. You know, the the swing that goes uphill, you know, drops the barrel early and swings uphill. That's built for a, a sinker, but it's built for like an 88 mile an hour sinker. Yeah. And it's going to run into curveballs, mm-hmm. you know, and sliders that are dropping more. But pitchers have made a change, and now we have to be able to cover all those pitches. And JT Real Muto, the catcher, by the way, what does delta mean? Just, just for a little more context. Delta, uh, you know, having a degree from Cal State Fullerton has provided me an, an education above many others. <laughs> so the delta delta in uh, mathematical terms means the difference. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go Titans. Go Titans. Go Titans. Tusk up. Um, 
JT Real Muto is catching. He is set up to the outside. I, I don't know. I guess Eflin probably misses his spot. He misses the pitch right down the middle. He probably misses his spot uh, yeah. five inches, maybe a little more, a little less. That's what happens, though, kids, when you miss your spot at the major league level to an MVP. You'll get hit hard. <laughs> That's good. And, and I just adjusted that on so we could see it from the front view, you know, of what happened with that pitch. And and that brings us back to possibly episode one. Mm-hmm. You know, if if he throws that pitch here mm-hmm. where Real Muto's setting up, yeah. he's not going to hit it out of the park. But what do we have to have? We have to have a swing that destroys mistakes. And he made that. That may have been the only mistake he made all game. In fact, that reminds me of a, I think it was Matt Carpenter. Mm-hmm. You know, he threw like a, a two-hit shutout a couple years ago. Not not Matt Carpenter. Who's the pitcher, Carpenter? Matt Carpenter's the third baseman. Matt Carpenter's the third baseman. Um, uh, yeah. Well. Big tall. Anyway. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, sorry Carpenter, sorry yeah. to you fans out there. Yeah. Um, the big, tall stud pitcher for the Cardinals. He, he was he pitched last year too. Oh, Chris, anyway, Chris Carpenter. Uh, it was three years ago. What's that? Chris Carpenter. Chris Carpenter. Yeah. Okay. And he, they said, "What? Why were you so good today? You know, you gave up two hits. One was an infield hit. One was a soft liner to center." He said, "You know what? I don't think I threw one pitch that wasn't on the outer channel or the inner channel. Mm-hmm. I didn't throw any pitches over the heart of the plate today." Yeah. I just have that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I don't care what kind of hitter you are. If a pitcher makes pitches on those channels, you're not going to be successful. You have to be ready to jump on that mistake. And uh, how, so how, what's Christian Yelich's adjustability like? I mean, is it, it's, it's above average, obviously above average, but it's, it's got to be in the top five in your eyes, right? Absolutely. So I paused the video for a second, so I'm going to just – reiterate what Jim said. He said, what's what's Yelich's adjustability like? So his adjustability is huge, number one, because he can t- control this stride. Okay, He can drop his foot anywhere from here if he gets beat to foul a ball off, or here if he's a little bit early. Okay, So he has that adjustability. He's probably had a stride like that since he was you know, 12 years old. Okay, And number two, when he lands, notice how his hands and front shoulders stay back. Okay? That, that is such a crucial position when I'm looking at players because he's got a chance. Look, we're going to get fooled all the time, and we're going to look bad all the time. And the more we can fight and foul off tough pitches means, hey, maybe we'll actually be able to get a mistake two pitches down the road. Okay, This is what enables him to do that. He gets to this position, and if it's go time, he goes. If it's not go time, he can get here. He can lose his lower half in front of him, meaning his lower half can open, but he can hesitate and keep his hands back for that split second in order to make that adjustment, just in case that pitch was maybe it was a changeup. Okay, he probably wouldn't have hit it out, but maybe he would have fouled it off because he could have hesitated from his launch position. So that's what makes him such a great hitter is is that adjustability factor. It's not one swing in one zone in one time. He has the ability to make those adjustments. You know, just looking at this swing, you would think that he knew what was coming. He's thinking along, and we've talked about this before, thinking along with the pitcher. It was like he knew, hey, a sinker's coming, and if he misses, I'm going to pounce on it. Yeah, I wish we could see, you know, what the count was here, you know, and what the situation was. Obviously, there's nobody on base. Oh, well, maybe there was somebody on base. But the way Real Moto Real Muto's sitting up, I'm not sure there's anybody on base. Um, but, yeah, it would be really nice to know the, the, the count situation and the game situation. You know, maybe it was a, a 3 nothing game, there's nobody on base, and it was the first pitch of the at-bat, and he was looking for a fastball, right? Or, or maybe he just was right on a slider the pitch before. And, and fouled it off or smoked it foul, right? Mm-hmm. And there, you know, now it, it presents itself to be a fastball count. But you got to be you got to be ready to hit that fastball. You got to be ready to hit that mistake with less than two strikes. Well, let's see here. So that you posed a good question. So that was on the 16th of May last year, and the score was tied zero zero. It was in the top of the first, one out, nobody on. So it was the first plate appearance of the day for Christian Yelich. Thank you, Baseball Reference, by the way. There you go. Yeah. So and that, and that's uh, you'd be surprised. You know, there's guys that hit home runs, 
And then there's guys that hit home runs when it's clutch. And there's a lot of home runs hit in the uh, seventh and eighth inning of a game where you're down five runs and nobody's on base. So that's where, you know, data and stats plays a big role. And, and guys that get paid. Yeah. Some guys get paid more with similar stats because of when they hit those home runs and when they get those extra base hits. Uh, let's go back to the toe touch here. Uh, I'm curious. I have my video paused right at the toe, right uh, at the toe touch, the open view. Okay. It looks to me that he has more more weight on his back leg at his toe touch than he does fifty fifty. Am I is something? Am I being deceived here? Or is that the coil that is kind of deceiving me? No, no. He if his front foot isn't on the ground, then I would say ninety eight percent of his weight is in his back back foot. Okay, in his back leg. And then if we go a few frames further, he drops his heel, and then the back heel comes up. Now you're probably looking at sixty percent on his front foot. Yeah and only 40% on his back leg. Then if we take it a couple frames further, when his foot comes all the way off the ground, he probably has over 90% of the weight pushing up through his front leg. So this is what ground force plates tell us. You know, We're able to actually chart that and see the amount of pressure and the amount of weight transfer. And that's kind of what it tells us. So the more you can get you know, back here moving into your front foot without lunging, not the easiest thing to do, but it is. It's, it's kind of weird. So in this position here, most players are going to be you know, it's like 99 when this foot, back foot gets to about this position and starts to move or come off the ground, you're at like 99 point something percent of your energy is in this front heel. Yeah. Then it starts to push back up the leg to turn the hip. The hip turns the obliques. The oblique starts to turn the shoulders. Then our backside starts to come through after that. And then after contact, the weight's going to start to sit on the back leg again. So... As a hitter, you're usually feeling all the weight here on the back leg. Why? Well, it feels like it's on the back leg while you're striding, and then it feels like it's on the back leg when you follow through. Okay, both of those take a lot more time than, say, you know, I would, I would say the swing. Once the weight gets off of the back foot here mm -hmm. and into the front foot, you're talking about, you know, it's going to be 0.15 seconds to here, you know, so maybe 0.2 seconds the weight isn't on the back foot and that's why players always think that their weight is back so video tells us really the story of what happened and so does you know the force plates is this uh, okay i'll ask that question in a second force i want to bring up the force plates though um what does that data do in helping you um determine a player's weight shift at least for you when you're coaching yeah, it tells us if they're if they're transferring their energy properly. Um, so, and again, you use it with with other devices to see if it makes a difference. So, if I have a player that doesn't stride very far, and their back foot squishes the bug, okay. So, what the ground force will tell us is instead of having that, you know, from ninety nine percent of the energy there to ninety nine percent here, yeah. they're like. You know, during the stride, it's, you know, 99 here. And then when they plant their front heel, they're still like, you know, 40% back here. Okay. So that tells us something when the bat speed, you know, what is our bat speed number when you do that? Your bat speed number is 70. Okay. What is your ball speed? Your ball speed is uh, 85. Okay, cool. So let's try to do this now. Let's try to shift that weight a little bit more into your front foot and maybe bring this knee down and in more. Okay, so that this foot comes off the ground. Okay, cool, let's try that. So he tries that, you know, after about five minutes, I say, okay, let, let a couple go here. Go ahead and swing, you know, with the same aggression you had before. And now all of a sudden he does that, and his bat speed goes to 73, and his exit velocity goes to 90. Okay, well, that's a change we need to make. But say we did that and it didn't do anything then he probably was doing something okay here. You know, it probably wasn't that bad. So we tested all that stuff. We tested we tested a, a, a drag where the foot goes forward like this, but low. We tested one where the foot comes up high, mm -hmm. which sometimes Bryce Harper kind of kicks it up because, he, you know, his upper body toes forward. We tested one where you didn't stride at all. You just kind of spun. And we tested one where you took a step, but you collapsed your backside and your foot went backwards. Okay, and by far, this, this was the winner. 
So if this is the winner for, for creating the most ground force and the most energy with players, that's kind of what we're going to teach. So if, if you put the video, for those who are following along, put the video two frames further, Christian gets to his torque and stretch position. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's as prototypical big league move as you can get. I mean, the bat mm-hmm. is at, on the, connected with the back shoulder. Hips are opened up, leading the hands. Shoulders are still closed. I, I can see the energy. I mean, the, the pants are wrinkled, so you can see the, the torque and the jersey's wrinkled. You can see the belt buckle, which is something you always point out to. The belt buckle's still back. I, I can see the energy coming through my screen. The energy his body in, is creating from the ground. Yeah, and, and he sequences everything up nicely. And um, a lot of people get to something similar to that, but they have a hard time keeping their shoulders in position, um, which is a timing factor. If you start too late, you don't have that chance. So, yeah, obviously this guy's the best, you know, for uh, – I shouldn't say the best, but he's one of the best in the, in the game right now as we, as we speak. And it's – we can learn things from him. And I remember Ted Williams told my dad, you want to be a good hitter? Copy the best hitters. Yeah. That's it. And he said – I remember Williams said – or my dad told me that Williams told him – that he he met Babe Ruth and I don't know when this was at some All Star game or something and Ruth came back it must have, maybe it was an All Star game like in New York or something yeah you know, Ruth was retired obviously and and older but Williams asked him how he learned to hit and he said he he watched Shoeless Joe Jackson like Shoeless Joe Jackson he thought had the prettiest swing he'd ever seen yeah yeah and, and yeah and again with Chris, with Yelich too taking it a couple of frames even further. He is at the point, his point of almost getting to the point of contact, but we talk about the barrel release and that whip created. We talked about that in previous episodes in the archives. I think it was on our upper body mechanical breakdown. Um, we talked about that. He's releasing this pitch, is, again, a sinker right down the middle, pretty much, center cut. I mean, Eflin misses his spot by like six inches. It's kind of ridiculous. Um, and he releases the barrel at, off his shoulder, creating that whip at a perfect time when you're supposed to. It's it's not he's not it's not lagging too far is what I'm trying to say. It's not lagging too far, yeah. And, and some guys will do that, and that's why he pulled this ball. You know, he, he pulled it towards the right center field as he released it at the right time. Some players that hold on to it. I had a conversation with somebody yesterday about you know, I, you know, people that don't stay inside the ball. Well, everybody stays inside the ball. Like I, some players release the barrel too soon, but their first move is always inside inside the ball. Otherwise, like, they wouldn't be playing anymore past, like, the age of 14 years old. So, but some guys will hold on to that, you know, that angle. Like, Tony Gwynn was a guy that held on to that angle, right? He kept the barrel behind his hands as long as he possibly could. He was an opposite field hitter that didn't have a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Could he have released the barrel more and created more whip? Absolutely. But he probably would have taken away 10 points of his batting average, and he wasn't willing to do that. So, yeah, he, this is one where he could have stayed inside longer and may have not had that barrel release, but pretty much any time you can release the barrel and you get to that proper extension position where both arms are totally straight and the top hand hasn't turned over yet, yeah. you're going to be in pretty good position. Yeah, and again, you keep going a couple of frames even further. You just see the uncoiling. It's, 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 oh, it's so great. It really is. <laughs> I mean, if you're a yeah, hitting guy, it's great. <laughs> yeah, if you're on the op- the opposing team, it's yeah. not nice. And uh, so I'm I'm pushing the frames here. I'm I'm at the, I'm, I'm actually at the frame uh, where uh, he's at the point of contact. He's in his power V, and the wrists are aren't turning over, but the whip is being completed. I think that's no rollover. The arms are starting to extend, and now his weight, as you mentioned before, it's starting to push back from that energy that was being released. Yep, and that's kind of, and that's how you you stay back. You're almost rotating back, is what it feels like as a hitter. Yeah. You're stepping forward, and then you're rotating back, um, and then that's what it feels. I'll tell you a quick, another quick story because people seem to like the stories, and I got to keep my dad's legacy legacy alive. Please do. The, the story is, I don't know what year it was, 1967 maybe. My dad goes into, he's with the, the Washington Centers. They go into to Yankee Stadium, which 
you know, which is where he grew up. My dad grew up in the in the Bronx when he was a kid, and so he goes in, and it's his first trip to Yankee Stadium, and they're taking early BP. It's like a it's a night game, but they got in town early, and it's it's like uh, I don't know one o'clock in the afternoon. It's hot, and you know he finishes around a BP, and the last two or three balls he hits like in the upper deck of of right field, you know, in Yankee Stadium. And as he walks out of the cage, he hears somebody yell, "Boy." We could use some power like that in this dugout. And my dad looks over, and it's Mickey Mantle, <laughs> and he's sitting. He's sitting in the Yankee dugout, like out towards the front, and he's in his. He's got his shower shoes on and a pair of like sliders, and he's just getting suntan. He's just like soaking up the sun, getting a sweat. So my dad's like, "Oh my goodness! Like I gotta get. I gotta get over there." You know, and my dad was probably twenty three at the time or something. He was fresh out of the minor leagues, like one year out. So he walks over and they're talking and you know whatever shooting the shooting the breeze and and my dad says you know Mick what do you what do you think about when you hit you know what what's kind of going what's your feel you know what are you feeling when you're in the box or when you're taking swings and he says he's Mike I don't know I don't, I don't really feel or anything he's like come on there's got to be something and, and so he looks at my dad and says well Mike what do you think about it? and he said well I feel like. I want to tuck my front shoulder under my chin as much as I can. And Mick looked at him and said, well, I definitely don't feel that. Yeah. <laughs> so my dad could took that one off the list. But he said, you know, I guess what I feel. So he grabbed a bat, again, in his underwear and shower shoes. He yeah. grabbed a bat, stepped out, like, you know, out of the dugout a little bit, and kind of went through his little waggle and his stance. And he said, I, I guess I feel like I'm – I'm stepping forward and falling backwards at the same time. I don't really know what that means, but that's kind of what I'm my head. Yeah. Fall and, and falling back at the same time. So my dad wrote it down on a napkin and found it, obviously, like years later with all his notes. But that's kind of what, we're, what you were just talking about, Jim. It was, you know, he's stepping forward, like he's got weight forward, but then as soon as he lands, his head's staying back, and by the time he finishes, that weight's going to finish, you know, over his back leg. And that's that's really the the proper way to to have a weight shift so that you you don't get too much on your front side. Yeah, yeah. So would you say the number would be fi- still fifty fifty when the toe a toe touch, or something? No, I would say it's fifty fifty at heel plant. Okay. What about a toe touch? Toe touch. I still think there's at least ninety percent of the weight on the back foot. Okay. Because yeah. that toe, it's toe heel, right? It's right. Um, and I stopped the video of this because it gets too long. It'll blow up on me. So okay. uh, the video, I mean, people will be able to go back and, and look at that part of the video when he's at toe touch. But actually, I'll start it again, and, and we'll, we'll talk about this, you know, toe touch position. We are talking about, you know, where's the weight at toe touch? It happens so fast. So from here, toe touch to heel plant is, uh, I don't know how, a two one hundredths of a second, right? It's not lined out. But somebody like Pujols back in the day, that didn't take a stride and just lifted his toe. He actually held weight on his toe, on his front from toe, right position. But Yelich here, it's just a transition. He's just his his toes touching, and then he goes straight into heel plant. So a toe touch, I would say most of his weight is on his back foot, and then two, you know, a couple one hundredths of a second later, when he gets to heel plant, now we're you know probably between toe touch and heel plant he's 50 50 okay he's gonna look 50 50 but once that front heel plants and that back heel releases in because this isn't a strong position with his back heel you can see it kind of rolls in his back knee rolls in yeah most of that weight is already starting to get here so you're only 50 50 for a very short amount of time well and it looks like he's still even with that weight on the back foot or the back leg Mm -hmm. at toe touch he's still falling forward the front shoulder also is is in the proper position, and that's uh, downward as well. The I don't know how much you believe in this, but the knob of the bat pointing towards the catcher's feet, kind of, I don't know, yep. it's simple fundamental. But, um, but yeah, it still looks like he's falling forward, but keeping that weight back. That's exactly what it is. So if you just looked at him and you didn't see his feet, he would look he would look very balanced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you look down and his front foot's not on the ground yet, then you realize that in reality, all his weight is on his back foot. I wonder if he uses the cue, um, if he's struggling or whatever the case may be. I wonder if he uses the cue keep. I got to keep my weight back and over and mentally overcompensates for that. But he's really not keeping it back per se. I think pretty much every athlete, you know, that that plays at a high level that has 
you know, this move with a stride. So I'm just kind of showing the stride there. They always have to think stay back. Because if you have this big move moving towards the ball, mm -hmm. then you're going to absolutely, like, um, you know, drift forward. So he's probably thinking, I'm going to step to it, but I got to get back, 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 sit down, sit down, keep my head back, you know, whatever it is, and stay yeah. behind the ball. And, and I think that's why most big leaguers, you know, think that way is because they do have that forward weight shift. You mentioned the head. What do you make of his head movement? It seems like he moves the head a lot especially when it's yeah. coiling? That's such a great question. Um, so, I mean, you should see how much uh, Josh Donaldson's head moves. I and mean, people talk about it. You can't move your head. Yeah. So if you're in your stance, how do you stride and not move your head? Totally impossible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to mark his eyes here when he's in his stance. Okay, what people don't realize is right about here, the ball's not out of the – the pitcher's still in his windup. He hasn't released the ball yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, he probably re releases the ball about right here. Okay. So now if I draw his eyes, you can see how much his, his head dropped. Yeah. But again, the ball's probably out of the hand here. And then even from there to heel plant, look at how much his head has moved. Yeah. Is that good? Probably not. Is it bad? Probably not because he didn't miss it. Um, but I will say that when you tell players not to move your head when you stride, that, that's not a possible move. If you do that, then what's happening is is you're not athletic. You're just kind of, you know, spinning, I guess. Yeah. Now, from heel plant, that's the key. You don't want that head to move. Yeah. Okay. Once that heel plant, I guess for him, it's going to be about, you know, there's heel plant, maybe one frame after heel plant. You don't want that, just because he's wider, you don't want that head to move forward. Okay. You got to try to keep that head as still as possible as your lower body starts to rotate and that that's what will give you this tilt here but um I, for me eyes level that's the big thing you know i don't want the i don't mind if the head moves forward i don't usually want it bouncing up and down too much so he's very upright to start and then he gets very athletic when he swings and a lot of guys do that so you know essentially his head moved his head finished there and his head started here that's that's a lot of head movement. So, um, I'm I'm not I, I don't and right or wrong, this doesn't mean I'm I'm right by any stretch of the imagination. But um, I I don't really I don't really care. Okay. You know, if a player has head movement like this, I could give you like 50 major leaguers that have head movement like that. And then Yelich's head moves just for for context. It moves down and then forward, but in a smooth kind of half circle yeah. type shape. It, yeah. It's so like it is it, it is a lot of movement, but are there are there yeah. drills for that to keep your eyes still focused on the baseball even with the head moving? Is there drills you do for that? Um not specifically. I just think the more you can hit if, if there's something you want to do, if you want to have a big stride or you want to have a leg kick, yeah. the key is to do it all the time. You know, if your head's gonna move, take as many swings possible where your, your head moves. Now I'm not talking about your head moving left or right. That's like one of the worst things you can do. Okay. So twisting backwards, you know, which most people don't do, but you know, a head pulling out, that's, that's very different. That's not what I'm talking about with head movement. So I don't really care all that much. You know, I will be cautious of it, but from here, you know, to here, I'm not cautious. It's from heel plant. I want those eyes to stay as still as possible as I'm rotating. Okay. That's the big thing because that keeps our, our spine still, and then it allows us to track that ball the last, you know, you know, 15 feet or so and until we, you know, not 15 feet to home plate. We're not really going to see the ball all the way to home plate, yeah. but the last 15 feet where we can make adjustments, which is, you know, usually the middle, you know, or I would say the, you know, let's see, that would be like the, you know, about 20 feet out in front of home plate, 25 feet out in front of home plate. That's where we got to make, you know, our decision. Because once that ball gets within about 10 or 12 feet from us, we can't make any physical adjustments. Our, our body can't contract fast enough. So um, if we can really zero in on that pitch, you know, early to about that, you know, that 20 foot window, 20, 25 feet from us, the quicker we can react to that, the better. That's what we use the win reality for. We use the virtual reality software sure. because it gives us drills. When are we making our decision? Is that a strike or a ball? Not when are we swinging? That's different. When are we? When does our brain say that's a, that's a hittable pitch or that's not a hittable pitch? 
And I'm looking at the hands, too. In his low, they barely move. I mean, they don't even move. He's got that box, I guess, so to speak, or half box with his arms at toe touch. I mean, that's that's part of the reason, too, right, that his swing is so short. He's, the, the hands are very simple. Yeah, there's, you know, there's the old minor league saying, walk away from your hands, right? Yeah. We're, we're not really seeing that. You know, typically when when a player strides forward, when their foot goes, I mean, I don't care what the hands do before the foot goes forward, but as the foot goes forward, most guys, uh, I don't care, you know, what they teach, but if you look at big leaguers, their hands aren't really moving and still loading in this position. They're already back, and then they're ready to go. If you're starting to move your hands back here, what happens is you'll typically leave them behind, and that creates a drag um, and arm barring. What do you make of his um, his leverage? I'm at the point of contact shot again. He's got the firm front side. He's on his back toe. I mean, the hips have clicked. They've snapped, so to speak. The knee's kind of coming together. What do you make of, of his leverage right there? Yeah, I mean, he's in a strong position, right? And he's going to have leverage because of the way he's built, yeah. you know, and he probably uses a – I don't know what size bat he uses, actually, maybe a 34 and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's going to create leverage and whip. You can imagine if he was trying to cut down a tree, you know, with an ax. That's a really strong position he's in because he has some space here in front of his, in front of his chest and his arms are right in front of his chest. So imagine you're trying to hold something heavy, like, a, say, a 45-pound plate, you know, in the, in the weight room. And I say, you got to hold this 45-pound plate with both hands in front of your body. Where are you going to hold it? Are you going to hold it with your hands down here? Are you going to hold it with your hands up here? Are you going to hold it with your hands? You're always going to hold it right in front of your sternum. Okay? That's usually the strongest point that we can support that object. And if we can use our legs well and our body well so that our hands can pretty much slot between the sternum and the belly button, okay, and then we can use our posture and we can use our legs to adjust to pitches that are lower than that and our vertical bat angle to adjust to higher or lower pitches, we're going to be very successful. But if, if we have a swing where sometimes you take your hands, you know, and they're down here at your belt, and then sometimes on a high pitch, you got to have your hands up here. That's going to create a lot of work for the body to do, and you won't be very consistent. And speaking of consistency, you look at the video here all the way through. He has Christian Yelich some of the most consistent mechanics, and he repeats his swing as good as anybody. Yeah, and you know, it's that could be. His athleticism, it could be his dedication and work, and it's, you know, it's his mechanics. They're very repeatable. There's, you know, like you said, he's got a long, really long stride, but it's not a huge high stride, right? He's just gliding into it. He has a hand load, but it's not a huge hand load, right? They go back a little bit, you know, right there as he just barely starts to come forward, and then they stay kind of still so he doesn't have a hitch or anything like that. Not that hitches are bad, but it just creates more – more things to go wrong when your timing isn't perfect, mm-hmm. where he's very, very, very simple, aside from the fact that his stride is, you know, if I mark where he starts, he actually brings it back. So let's say this is about as far back as his stride goes. You know, his stride, when people talk about, you know what, your stride should be four to six inches, I think his stride was like 24 to 30 inches. Well, when his, yeah, when his feet, when his feet are they're spread apart, yeah, kind of torque position. I mean, that's bat length right there. Yeah, so it's you know what it's 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 up to the individual. Yeah. We can't have a cookie cutter approach to hitters. You know, everybody's going to do things a little bit different differently. And that's why we try to assess guys first. You know, what's your body type? What are your natural moves? You know, if your natural moves want you to be wide, I'm not going to make you be narrow because it won't work. Like when as soon as the stress of a game comes up you're going to absolutely stride that far, okay? Like, that's a no-brainer, okay? So even though we practice with half that stride, as soon as that pitch comes at you, you're going to go here. So you know what? Let's find a way to make this work. Or vice versa, we're more of a Nelson Cruz, kind of a narrow, we hang out on our toe. Mm -hmm. That's natural for you. Let's find a way to make that work. 
Well, this was fun. Our first installation of our video breakdown mechanical series. And we do this every fifth episode. Again, Jake will be posting the video on his uh, Facebook page, the Epstein Hitting Facebook page. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. New episodes released every Monday at 9 a.m. We appreciate all the listens. Be sure to follow Jake and I, too, on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Jim Tara. On both platforms, Jake is at Epstein Hitting. And, uh, Jake, next week we're going to be diving into some softball swing mechanics, the similarities and differences between baseball and softball swings, because, you know, girls do swing bats, too. Yeah, they usually swing them better, too, you know, <laughs> yeah. so. Excited to do that. No, I, I wish I didn't say they swing it better, but I will say uh, that'll be a really fun episode because girls, uh, they work differently. Um, they, they work differently than the guys. They're very regimented. Um, they they do what you say. Hey, do this move, and they'll go do that move, you know, a thousand times until you see them again. So um, that'll be a fun episode. The body works in, in, in uh, very similar ways to create energy, and uh, we can talk about the differences as well. That'll be a lot of fun. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast. We'll be talking about that next week. Thank you for joining us this week. Stay safe, and we will talk to you soon. Take care.